it's a part of me that is into public performance and exhibition is almost like unlisted or a public. And I'm like, Ooh, how do I get it today? So I think I always click public on that for better or for worse. Hello, internet. Desert Flora? Yeah. For, we need to have a new marker color called Cellular Flora. That's all the colors of the things that we, colors of the stains that we use to stain different cell parts and things like that. Does this work? Does this work? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. There we go. Trying to adjust the camera and I made it worse. I'm still making it worse. It's like every time I touch it, I make it worse. I was going to say, oh, that's weird. It's like one of those infinite video loops, yeah. you know? It's like, what's going on here? There we go. Perfect. So, so last time we talked all about prokaryotes, eukaryotes, and uh, what they do and how they work. Well, not really how they work. What they do or the properties of them, kind of. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Yay. Um, and so today we're going to talk all about the U karyotes, the eukaryotes. And a lot of people uh, sort of, if you've had this conversation before in a biology class, it's usually in the context of cellular anatomy, where we list out a bunch of organelles and we talk about what they do. Um, although that is an effective way to put people to sleep, it is not an effective way to teach biology. Because ultimately, um, and this is more of a conversation for Bio 102 than Bio 101, but because so many of you all see next semester, uh, one thing that we say over and over again in Bio 102 is how many systems are there? How many systems are there? And we have this conversation because um, Bio 102, you'd like to go through all the organ systems. It's like gastrointestinal system, cardiovascular system, circulatory system, hmm, all the skeletal system, all this kind of stuff. It's like a run through the systems a little bit. And, in, and I think people do it that way because you have a textbook. And nothing is more linear than the written word, despite you know uh, literary attempts for his for, for for hundreds of years. Books are linear things. You know the nervous system is chapter five, the circulatory system is chapter six, the skeletal system is chapter seven. Well, that is your adventure base. Still, though, I mean, it, it's it's forced into linearity. It's forced into linearity. You know, so it's it's good to. Um, remind people that the body is not quite so um, or organized in such a particular way. You know, there really is one system here, which is the whole interoperable part. You know, so all these parts interact with each other all the time. All, all the time, right? So, for example, um, when my dad uh, started having the initials um, stages of, of heart failure, right? When his heart started to not work so high, um, the first the first thing that happened, the first symptom that showed up was that his feet would swell up. And he started to retain a lot of water. So it's like what the heart failure did, it mucked up his blood pressure a little bit and he started retaining a lot of water. So it's like many, many, many times for a lot of heart maladies, the first place they show up is in the function of the kidneys, right? So. So it's like, I, I have heart failure, so why am I taking a diuretic, you know, to, to pee a lot? It's like, well, heart, kidneys, they interact with each other. They relate with each other. They, how many systems really are there here? Because the more you look, the more intertwined you see all these things sort of being. And so whereas we could go through the cell and all that kind of stuff as a system by system or an organelle by organelle way, I prefer to teach this in a way where we start at the nucleus, work our way out, and we see how all these parts interact with each other. Um, not in terms of the anatomy and the discrete features of it, but more in terms of how does information flow from the DNA to the outside of the cell. So that's my perspective. Sorry. Sorry. Do you have heart failure if you drink too much caffeine? Heart failure if you drink too much caffeine. Not that I'm aware of. 
but your pressure may go up a little bit and uh, you're going to be releasing some adrenaline throughout the day in a higher volume. Uh, it might, uh, whether it is long term, up or down, is always. I mean, every week you get a different answer on whether too much caffeine is, is good or bad. I remember reading a bunch of articles, though, about people who like took a lot of, like, like drank a lot of monster energy drinks, like mm -hmm. Red Bull, and they would have to get like pacemakers and stuff because, like, their heart. Yeah, I can believe it. Yeah, I can believe it. Because it went so fast. But it's like, yeah. off, yeah. Yeah. Went too fast and it broke. Yeah. <laughs> but it took multiple months. Yeah, I mean these are these are the levels, you know. And I don't know if that's too much caffeine or it's it really falls into the realm of like caffeine toxicity, you know, where it's like you're over you're over the LD fifty of a lethal dose with with a monster a couple of monster energy drinks. Back in the day, um, this wasn't longer than five or six years ago. You could buy um, like powdered caffeine from supply companies, and it's like that that that's a very bad idea to do that. You can still get caffeine. I don't think you can. I think no. they, you, you, but I mean, you can no longer get like powdered caffeine to put in stuff because it's like the potential for disaster is very, very high. And it does not take much to have the desired effect. I mean, when we're talking about a cup of coffee, we're talking about milligrams. We're talking about milligrams in a cup of coffee. So it's like it's, it's a very low effective dose uh, with caffeine in order to have the, the result. So interesting stuff. Um, cells. Awesome. You ready to get to it? Perfect. I'm still trying to get this so you can actually, there we go. That ain't bad. I think I will start with a, what color is a nuclear envelope? Blue or green. Blue or green. I have better blues than I have greens. Would you like it to be a dusty powdery blue? Yeah. Yes. Kat, would you like this image to focus very, very quickly? Let's see what it does. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. I need to draw something like right here, you know. Hey, now. Awesome. It's like once it finds it, it's cool. It's the original finding of that sort. This is a nuclear envelope. Well, do annotations in red? A nuclear envelope. Pardon my handwriting. Um, I drew three lines here because each one of them represents um, part of a phospholipid bilayer. What's weird about the nuclear envelope, which is not true for um, like the cell membrane and things like that, is it is double membrane. So it's like it's two membranes thick. So like here's a phospholipid bilayer and here's a phospholipid bilayer. Double membrane, thick wall, thick wall, double step. Durable stuff, yeah. Yeah, stuff. yeah, it's like double stuff, like the Oreos, you know? Did you have a fried Oreo? Did anybody have one of the fried Oreos? They had them here? Yeah. They were sort of out. Let's get classy, yeah. go get fried Oreos. Go get a fried Oreo Oreos. if you want to fry. No, they don't have Nothing that happens in this class is more important than a fried Oreo <laughs> on, a, on a wonderful spring day. Since it has two, um, five, yeah. five, 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 Right, but you raise an interesting question though with, with regard to all of this, because what's in here? What's in this nuclear envelope? It represents what's inside of it. What's housed within this nuclear envelope? What's in the nucleus here? Huh? Yeah. DNA. What color is DNA? Red, blue. It depends on how it's done. Depends on the stain you're using, right? <laughs> Oh, uh, how about a purpley color? Does that work? Yeah. Okay. DNA. Awesome.
Awesome. Awesome. Uh, what does this represent? What, what's the DNA for? What are we doing here with it? Why have DNA? What is the DNA doing? Instructions. Instructions? You got to be better than that. Coding for how to make new things. For coding. For coding what? Enzymes. Enzymes, which do what? Functions. Stuff. <laughs> uh, stuff like what? Like a lot of stuff like things. Stuff like things, right? Yeah. Speed up reactions. Yeah, speed up reactions. You know, enzymes facilitating stuff. Proteins, right? For building structures, things like glycogen and collagen, things like or things like collagen, like yeah, collagen and uh, good stuff like that. Good stuff like that. Awesome. There's a sound we don't hear often. So the cell membrane, the cell membrane, I'm going to flip this around just for a second. The cell membrane is all the way out here. Here's the cell membrane out here. So everything outside of the cell membrane here is like the environment. Yeah, it's like outside stuff. Grass, trees, um, the, the membrane of another cell, maybe, you know, uh, whatever here is outside of the cell is what is outside of that cell. So Davion asked an excellent question. So what's in between these two? Right, this conversation we're having today is right between these two, these two membranes. What's with all the stuff? And um, as you know, many of the enzymes that we know and use and love and operate with um, are enzymes that are released out of the cell and into the body. So it's like whenever we make a protein or anything like that that needs to get out of the cell the basis of which is informed within the DNA, you have to get something that the instructions of which are here, and you have to get that thing constructed out here and then produced and dumped in the environment out here. So how does information go from here to something released in the environment out here? And so you need things to do that, like mitochondria, chloroplasts, Golgi, smoothie arm, roughy, right? So each one of these organelles sort of plays this role um, in doing this thing where the DNA that we have that contains all of our traits and all of our states and our history um, can be expressed in the totality of the cell. So at five o'clock today, we're going to get injected with a product made by Pfizer, um, which means tomorrow's going to be a fun ride. Yeah, so I'm going to go to Safeway, and they're going to say, right or left? I'm going to say, dealer's choice. Wow. And they're going to, <laughs> and, they're going to yeah. and uh, by tomorrow, I should have a nice low-grade fever. So if you want interesting emails tomorrow, send me one, and I'll see how I respond. Um, but at least I'll get a good night's sleep. I learned don't, don't, get, don't get them in the morning, because then you'll start to hit right when you're trying to go to bed, and you'll sleep lousy. So that's that. So um, what's going to happen here? Uh, Safeway is going to inject some Pfizer-made messenger RNA into my body. Um, it's going to cross the cell membrane right here. It's going to hang out in here where um, some ribosomes are going to convert it into spike proteins. Those spike proteins are then going to get dumped back out where my immune system can recognize it and start to freak out a little bit and build up an antibody response. So um, the difference being here, we're not taking messenger RNA from Safeway and Pfizer and putting it into the cell. We're getting messenger RNA based on the DNA here, putting it in kind of cytoplasm to be expressed out to the environment, all right? So to, to Tavion's point once again, so what happens in here is kind of important, right? Yeah, so this is where life happens in this gap, in this space between these two things. Cell membrane is single membraned, nuclear envelope is double membraned, and there are little pores, Giselle, all over the nuclear envelope where stuff can get in and out. These are called nuclear pores. Nuclear pores. If you're going to have a nice big wall like this, you do have to provide a framework for stuff to be able to pass out and stuff to be able to make it in. 
Hey, Sarah, what are you talking about? Nuclear pores. Yeah, nuclear pores, yeah. Nuclear pores. Little channels through which stuff can go. I gave up when trying to spell nuclear about two thirds of the way through. You get the point, yeah. I'll, I'll do it the side of in and just sort of underline from there. Mm, nuclear force. Cool. Um, the first thing that, okay, so let me go back. Let me talk about this in process. What happens if, okay, so something's happening in the environment. We want to do something about something. We want to, some stimulus arises and we want to make a protein. Perfect. Uh, there's a gene in here that right here says, ooh, okay, I know how to make that protein. Awesome. Let's make some. And so what will happen is this part of the DNA where that gene is, right there will be accessed by all sorts of lovely enzymes, um, particularly one called helicase, which does a really good job of unwinding the DNA strand because it's double-stranded, so it has to get unwound. And then followed by another one called RNA polymerase. As you recall, enzymes are named after what they do. A lot of times, enzymes are named after what they do. So if you want an enzyme that makes a polymer of RNA, why not just call it RNA polymerase? Okay. How do we make copies of DNA? DNA, DNA polymerase. Yes. Good job, Naomi. And so that part of the DNA is accessed by all sorts of fancy, I'm trying to think of what color RNA is. Orange, I can do orange. And a single strand of RNA is then produced. Just the length of the gene, a little more complexity to this than letting on, but that's a conversation for you to have in your genetics class. Long story short, make the full strand of RNA, which Remember the transcription translation when we used the codons to, to make a protein chain? Remember that? From back then? This is the raw material for that process then. This would be the RNA strand that we can get our codon table out. We can read through, block together the amino acids we want to get the protein. Good? Right? So we read part of the DNA. We made this strand of RNA. Little bitty thing, but it has all the information we need for action. And we cannot immediately turn this RNA. We cannot transcribe and translate this thing. In this case, it would be to translate this thing into a protein here because we don't need the protein in here. We need the protein in the middle. Ah, here. And if we make the protein in here, then it's going to be too big to get through the nuclear pore. Right? So it's like we only want to make proteins in here that we're going to use inside the nucleus. The rest of them, we have to take this loverly strain of RNA and send it out. So does the cell membrane also have nuclear pores? Or it doesn't. We're going to use a different process to get the protein out of the environment. You're going to love it, though. Exocytosis, you would call that. Exocytosis. Neat. Which brings us to our very first organelle, which seems like a lilac color to me for some reason. Kat, does that feel right? This one is continuous with the nuclear envelope. It sort of uh, smushes into it. They're they're different in their um, in, in their name and they're definable from each other, but they sort of attach to each other. A bunch of plated up stacks that look like just like a bunch of plated together gooey kind of smushed up stacks, almost like the um, candy burger. Oh, oh, the oh, the oh, the yeah, the Krabby Patty. It's like there's stacks. Oh, you have one still. Yeah. Here, can you toss it up here and use it as a as a as a rough ER. So it's sort of smushed together like a bunch of. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. Like a bunch of stacks. Uh, upon each one of these is a little structure referred to as, I have too many light colors, I need some darker ones. 
a ribosome. And what is this rough ER made out of? So the dark blue dots here are the ribosomes. The membrane itself is phospholipid bilayer. Phospholipid bilayer yet again. Yet again. So what will happen is Mr. RNA will then come over and will attach to one of these ribosomes. It is on the ribosome. The ribosome is my workbench. So when you went through the activity of having the codon table in front of you and the strain of RNA, and you were doing the first codon, or first nucleotide, second nucleotide, third nucleotide, and you were kind of putting those amino acids in order based on that, the, the literal surface upon which that happens is a ribosome. That's your workbench. That's your workbench. So that's what the RNA is being turned into right now? It is not being turned into anything. The information that is contained within the RNA strand mm. is being translated into a protein. They're remaining intact, but it's being translated on the surface of a ribosome. Right? So it's like there's not a there's not a like straight mass-based physical conversion of RNA into protein. It's the information on one is transcribed and translated to the information on another. And, messenger, and RNA or messenger RNA is the go-between. So what happens when you get pfizer or moderna as a vaccine, the messenger RNA goes into the cells on the outside, attaches to a ribosome, gets converted into spike protein, and then pumped back out. Right, so you're doing sort of the exact same thing, but using actual U-based nuclear information as the basis for the messenger RNA. This is a lot, the analogy I use a lot of times, it's like going to the library back when people used to go to libraries. And people used to go to libraries back when there were books in libraries and before the internet. Because as I so often say in my classes, when I was your age, <laughs> We didn't have the world's knowledge at our fingertips. We had to go to the library to get it. And so uh, Library of Congress still sort of works this way, though. Has anybody been to the Library of Congress downtown? Beautiful building. Yeah. Like a copy of the Magna Carta. They have all kinds of awesome stuff. Uh, it is not like Fairfax County Library. You cannot check books out. It's like you cannot leave the building because Congress might need that book for something. You know, but you can go there and you can visit and you can access information. You can get, you know, stuff out of it. But in order to get stuff out, you either have to take a notebook and like write it down, take notes, or you have to put it on a copy machine and leave with it. So you can't leave with the whole book. And you're going to get arrested if you tear a page out. I suspect I have not tested that, but I can only imagine. <laughs> Probably a little dicey about that. Um, so you have to take this whole, you know, the information you want of this whole volume of information, copy it into a form that you can transport out and then leave with it. This is the exact same thing. You can't leave the nucleus with DNA. You have to take the bit you want, copy it into RNA. You can leave that and do stuff with it. That's sort of the analogy that I use. That's how I do that. And then um, what you can do then on the rough ER with one of these ribosomes, you can build a protein. And if you use one of these ribosomes that is actually on the rough ER, that protein is going to be this cool thing where it, it becomes a little orb of phospholipid, like a little micelle or a little vesicle that has the actual protein that you made embedded within the membrane of it, which is kind of neat. So you'll end up with an actual piece of, I was going to say, where's my rough ER lilac? You'll end up with a little piece of phospholipid bilayer that has on it, I'm trying to think what color proteins are. The protein that you make. 
So on every cell in your body, you have um, some markers. You have enzymes in there that respond to hormones in the environment. You have your blood type stuff, A, B, O, that kind of stuff. Your cell has markers, tags, proteins, recognition stuff, um, adhesion proteins that your cells use to stick to each other, all over them, embedded within the surface of the membrane, yes? Remember uh, there was an excitement about 10 weeks ago when you had to draw a cell membrane and you had to like embed proteins in it? Yeah, how do you get proteins embedded in a, in a cell membrane? You're like that. Naomi. What's your blood type? A positive. Oh, I get an A plus on everything. Oh, mine's a B plus. I think B positive. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Why? Well, what well, did you grade with A plus, B minus? Oh, oh. I thought you were like. No, that's fine. No. Uh, we do blood typing in bio one or two, though, if you want to. Yeah, A positive. What's the rarest blood type? Is it like O negative? A B negative. A B negative. Mm. You have that. <laughs> Oh, no. Is that true? AB, AB negative or AB positive? It's, it's not easy to be. I got AB positive with one of those common ones. Yeah. And then I got O negative with one of those common ones. AB's not usually common. O, o is more, I mean, when we talk about how common things are, you want to think about like global geography and we want to think about the United States. O is super common in Asia. Um, a and B are more common in the West. AB negative. It's pretty, it's pretty rare. Yeah, it's pretty rare. And O is universal donor? Yes, okay. AB negative is the universal number. Oh, AB negative. Yeah. Okay. And if you have AB positive blood, it's like don't even bother giving it away. Nobody wants it. You know, AB it's like no. The only people that can take it is other AB positive. So it's like just don't even bother. Well, I think they still want it. Yeah. I mean, Red Cross will give you a cookie and some apple juice and say, you know what, just have a nice day. I mean, they might. <laughs> they might. They might. They might. If they can make sure they get all the blood out of it, but yeah. You do. So um, what happens in this case, you would specifically access these genes and make these proteins on the, uh, the rough ER if you are intentionally making a protein that's going to be embedded in the cell membrane. So this will then sort of migrate its way over to the cell membrane and sort of fuse with it in a way where you now have that protein is part of the cell membrane, which is kind of cool. So this whole thing we would call the the rough endoplasmic reticulum. External to that, moving outwards from where we are, we would encounter a new organelle that does different stuff. It's equally uh, Krabby Patty looking, uh, stacked up just like the rough ER is, but this is the smooth ER. I'm just going to say ER just like that because it's ease of use. What makes the rough ER rough and the smooth ER smooth? Ribosomes, Ribosomes yay. Or uh, the smooth ER smooth because of the lack of ribosomes in the environment. Which means, is the smooth ER making proteins? No, it is not, right? It does not have the workbench on which to do so. So um, clearly doing other stuff. What it is doing is and lipid synthesis and conversion. So let's say you need to make some lipids. Let's say you uh, ate, you, you consumed, uh, you went to Olive Garden, you have the never ending pasta bowl and the breadsticks. Mm -hmm. I would avoid the breadsticks if I were you. They're not as good as they used to be. Oh. Uh, I don't know. Am I right or am I right? I hate the breadsticks. <laughs> oh, it's like, I remember them being yeah. better than that. I like the bread and pasta material. You know what's fun about this class? You know why I love you guys so much? Because we have this lovely conversation about the cell. 
And then I disown the Olive Garden breadsticks, and then I get a poll of the best breadsticks in the next county. <laughs> just go to Best Buns, you know, and, and just go to Best Buns. And, and... Uh, some of my some of my second and third cousins in in the foothills of southern Missouri uh, own a restaurant chain called Lambert's. It's extraordinarily uh, extraordinarily popular in the, in the Midwest, but it is the home of throwed rolls. So it's this little down home sawdust on the floor kind of place, although it's huge and the food is really good. And if you want something fried, they got it. Um, and it's like some of my second cousins are, are Lambert's, which is kind of neat. Uh, and it's like, if you want to roll, you just kind of put your hand up and some dude like across the restaurant is like, <laughs> Ooh, like I'm not kidding. Well, like chuck a, ho a roll at you. The home of the throwed roll, home of throwed roll, Lambert's. Oh, yeah, I don't know what that's like. I don't know if they work up, work up to the roll throwing position or what. Good stuff. Um, so lipid synthesis. So um, you eat a lot of carbohydrates and you want to convert them to lipids to store, you know, as triglycerides later on. Or as in my case, what I'm trying to do, you know, it's like take the triglycerides, break them apart. Um, I'll take the glycerol, three carbon thing in the top and convert that into a, a sugar, which I can sort of use. Then I'll take the fatty acid shales and I'll chunk them into two carbon, three carbon things and make um, uh, ketones out of them. You know, I'll go ketogenic, you know, because I'm eating less than 50 or 60 grams of carbs a day, uh, which is essentially the, the conversation about why, why we do this. So it's like when you have an extraordinarily low carbohydrate diet, why do you make ketones? Um, your brain works on glucose. And really no other sugar makes it into the crosses the blood brain barrier into the brain like glucose does. But one thing that you can, if you don't have enough sugars, actually use for fuel for the brain and all the neurons of the brains are ketones. Right? So it's like as you start chopping out these, chopping chopping up these triglyceride fats, you can't turn them into carbohydrates through and through, but you can take the tops of them, turn those into glucose sugars and the long fatty acid chains. They'll turn into ketones, which can then cross over and you can make ATP out of uh, in the brain. In the brain, so it's all about keeping the brain alive. Which, given my profession, is a good idea. It's a good idea. So that happens here in the uh, in the smooth ER. Make lipid lipids there. Lipid synthesis. Lipid conversion. Excuse me, professor. Of course. It says rough endoplasmic reticulum. Retic. That's an undoubted eye. It's a source of all confusion. Retic you lum. That helps. Dotting it made a big difference. Absolutely. Difference between a dropout and a PhD is whether you dot that eye right there. It is true. <laughs> it's like it really it is. Naomi, you don't want to know how true that is. You know. Yeah, you don't want to know how true that is. Moving outward from there, okay, so, I mean, long story short, you can break off little chunks of this thing as well. You can make um, lipids that you want to, you know, display to the environment, great. You can truck those out and make lipid packets that then show lipids to the environment as well. Fantastic. The third organelle stack out from there. looks a little different. It's a, it's um, stacks. This is probably more like the Krabby Patty than the ER is. Stacks, it's like discrete stacks of this thing. And it's called the Golgi apparatus. Oftentimes just referred to as the Golgi. Golgi bodies, the individual unit of. Naomi, did you take biology before? In high school, yeah. Did you pay attention? No. It seems like you paid attention. I'm just saying. Maybe more got in there to give yourself credit for. Yeah, well, there you go. That'll do her. Yeah, the only thing I remember from the cellulite in high school bio is just that the Golgi looked like a stack of things. Yeah, the Golgi. So what fun thing can happen here is, now this is a fun one. What you can do, you can take a vesicle that has a protein on it, you can send it over to the Golgi. You can take 
a vesicle that has lipids on it, and you can send it over to the Golgi. What the Golgi team can do is make a vesicle that has a combination of the protein and the lipid that it's smushed together. You can make lipoproteins, right? It's a, it's a side grouping that you can have, that you can embed in a cellular wall um, that is part protein and part lipid. You can combine sugars from the Golgi with proteins from this rough ER and make glycoproteins. You can combine uh, sugars from the from the Golgi or from the from the uh, smooth ER with uh, lipids from the same place and make a glycolipid. Right, all kinds of good stuff. So the Golgi is where you can sort of do the mashup. That's where you can make the mixtape. You can take the stuff that is made from the rough ER and the smooth ER and produced by the Golgi itself and smush them together into composite molecules, which can be shockingly useful for prolonged life. So here's a vesicle that is like half protein with like a lipid chunk coming off of it that does some interesting and weird sort of thing. And then it can go over and fuse to the cell membrane and make this weird lipoprotein thing. Then it can now present to the environment as an attachment site for hormones, for cell messengers, for other proteins, whatever it might be. It's kind of cool. Is that also a protein? It's both. Protein. It's a, it's a, it's a, what did I say this was a lipoprotein, right? It's half lipid, half protein. You can do the same with a sugar zone. You can make a sugar down here and like a glycoprotein or glycolipid. You can do all combinations. Depending on what needs sort of might be. Sort of what needs might be. Um, a good example of a protein that you might attach into the cell membrane wall of a good cell would be, I mentioned these before, some of these attachment attachment proteins where it literally looks like a sharp barbed hook like that. They're kind of neat. And why have a sharp barbed hook facing outward through the cell membrane like this anchored to the membrane? Well, another cell is going to attach onto it and it's going to get stuck on there like a fish hook. That's how we maintain multicellularity. How do your cells stick together? They have to be attached together by something. You know, some of them are hooked, some of them are stitched, some of them are riveted, right? All of these cell um, passages and adhesions that you have for cells to stick together but yet still communicate with each other are all protein, carbohydrate, lipid based stuff. But so, do they? Like they stab themselves, or do they hook on together? They will <clears throat> puncture it here. But some of them will be like a long thread and will just kind of wind back and forth across the cell membrane of both, like it's stitched. Others will be like a open on both sides, kapoosh, riveted together. Your cells stick together in all sorts of interesting ways. You know, but it's like if you've seen a cell, they're pretty flimsy and there's not much to them. So, how do you maintain this? Your cells just don't fly off, you know, into a pile. You know, uh, they stick together, they adhere to each other, and that's not just because they're sticky. They have properties constructed by the DNA associated with them that adhere them together, which is neat. Which is neat. What if you need a protein that is not that is not uh, to be either dumped to the outside of the cell or embedded in the cell membrane? Well, what if you just need a, an enzyme or a protein that works here inside of the cell just to make sure cellular stuff happens? Well, I have good news. You also have free floating ribosomes that can make that work happen. So if the proteins are going to be embedded in the membrane or if they're going to leave the cell, they're made in the 
rough ER. If the proteins are going to leave, or sorry, are going to be used inside of the cell for cellular work, they're going to be made on one of these ribosomes that are free floating. Workbenches all over the place, some free floating for cellular use, some attached for extracellular use. Okay? Perfect. Perfect. And to harken back to familiar things, what else do you have in these cells? Well, of course, you have stuff like you per se do not have them. Right. Plants, plants, photosynthetic eukaryotes, things like that. Um, as well, also a nice double membrane thing that contains thylakoids. And all that kind of good stuff. And you also have, as you would imagine, when I'm out of colors up here, and I need to get, a, need to get another one now. Right? Oh, this will work. Very strangely shaped mitochondria. I think I fit as much on the piece of paper as I can. Anymore would only take away from the whatever it is. Questions, thoughts. Questions, thoughts. Anyway, so I, I do ask you have a question. Okay. Um, so the phospholipid is the big um, globby thing before the Golgi, right? So the ribosome. All of well, all of these things. The nuclear envelope. Rough ER, smooth ER, the Golgi, mitochondria, chloroplasts, all of these are made of phospholipid. All of these membranes, the cell membrane, all of these membranes are phospholipid. Oh, so. Gonna make a membrane? It's gonna be a phospholipid. Right, right. So the the membrane that has the the, uh, the rough endoplasmic and the smooth ER, everything else in there, the ribosomes, are they like keeping it together? They're not. They're just embedded in it as a surface place where you can make proteins. Oh, oh okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, I mean, they're really nothing more than the workbench on which protein synthesis happens. Okay. Yeah. Protein synthesis. So we can think about the cell. So this is like, this is all of it. Here's the whole thing. Where, so if I wanted to extract some cells from you or from someone, cells that had a lot of rough ER in them, but not a lot of other stuff, where would I harvest that from? So what I mean by that is like each of these are components that you can sort of mix and match. Some cells have a lot more rough ER. Some cells have a lot more smooth ER. Some cells have a lot more Golgi, right? If I had a willing participant and a 10 inch syringe with a needle on it, and I wanted to harvest cells that have a lot of rough ER, where would I harvest from? Thigh what? There's lower yeah. muscles there. Yeah, muscle tissue. Muscle tissue. Where you get a lot of protein growth. Right? The lining of the stomach that makes a lot of enzymes. Right? Some of those, uh, some of those cells. You're gonna have a lot of rough ER. Any place in your body where you make a lot of protein, muscle, for example, you're gonna have a lot of rough ER. Where might I find a lot of smooth ER? A lot of lipid synthesis. I was going to say left, right side, Impending. right below the rib, rib cage. What side? Appendix? Other side. Oh. Liver. Liver. Oh, liver. liver. Yeah. I was like, other side. Yeah. Pancreas is over here. Right? Oh. Liver. Point to the right side of your body, right underneath your rib cage. Liver. Don't poke too hard because you die. You're dead. Well, maybe I've overstated that. Like the degree growth. Don't poke it, you'll die, right? Um, I say that I mean, it's so heavily 
uh, anastomo is innervated with circulatory elements, like if you get like shivved or shot in the liver, it's like, ee, you bleed enough real quick, right? It's, you don't want to you don't your liver. You don't, well, you don't get shot at all. You're absolutely right, Naomi. Mm -hmm. Right? But, if, if you had to get shot, <laughs> where's the best spot to get shot? <laughs> okay, so we like the breadsticks at Texas Roadhouse. If we had to get shot, the best place to do it. <laughs> 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 do you like, do you like it depends on the gun. What are we talking about? Like a 50 caliber? Oh, yeah, are we yeah, talking about like a 22? Yeah. Yeah. What? 50 caliber, you're, what? You're, you're bent on it. It looks real yeah, yeah, so it's like, yeah, in, in the muscle somewhere. It's not going to be the whole. So probably, we're in a lot of probably the butt. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a neighbor who was a World War II veteran, and he had a bullet that was in his butt. Yeah. He got like shot at um, Normandy or something. No, no. I don't know where. But like on a beach in France, and it was like, <laughs> just a bullet in his butt his whole life. Yeah. That's pretty Such an interesting story. I know. Yeah. Or one of those brain shots that like, goes too fat. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, I got shot. But then he got to go home, like afterwards. What's good? Yeah. 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 yeah but he had like a Did his part for our country. Yeah. Got shot he got shot in the ass. <laughs> lived to tell the tale. <laughs> but that's the important part, right? <laughs> that's it, right? He lived, to, he lived to tell the tale. So that's, yeah. that's, what I would, that's what I would say. But I mean, there are parts of you, well, that, uh, this is a minor one or two conversations. Kind of I mean, there are parts where you don't got to get, you don't have to get shot bad, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's, there were sensitive spots in others, right? If you remember the Redskins player about 15 years ago, right, about 10 years ago, uh, shot and killed, he got shot in the, in the inner thigh, hit his moral order. Um, he got to death pretty quick. You know, so it all depends. Some places are more sensitive than others. Wasn't there that hockey player that got like his throat? Lift. There were. There's been a couple. Survived. There's been a couple. He survived because it's like the first aid guy was like military and knew when to. It is uh, there was there was a, another a college hockey player that the same thing happened. He did not survive. Yeah, um, it was pretty recent. Wasn't it? Yeah, it was pretty yeah. recent. Uh, the one that you're probably talking about. Um, he didn't get. My wife has this like terrifying. She never ice skates because she's worried she'll fall down and somebody will skate over her hand oh, and cut her fingers off. Oh, but I'm like, I don't know if that actually happens. I don't think they're sharp enough. But. Uh, they're probably sharp enough. Well, you can think about it, but they stand on each other and they don't cut their hands. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if logic is going to be the way out of that. Which, oh, you know, I don't, I don't think it's you funny. <laughs> but uh, what happened with the, with the, it was the goalie, right? Yeah. The, yeah. Um, he was on the ground. Yeah, he was on the ground. Yeah, and blood and whatever. And um, he got, he got hit in a very curious and, and forceful way in the mask, in the base of his, of the mask, kind of cut the neck. Watch yeah, concerned. and um, what the paramedic on the ice did was they he literally took his finger and like drunk. Oh my god, drunk yeah, baby. yeah. I mean, there's no no amount of drug pressure is gonna so, stop that, so it's like, plunk, me, yeah, stuck his finger in it until uh, until he could get him. I don't know what stabilized even means in a situation like this, Wait, you know. He, he survived that one. Yeah, he survived. Yeah, he survived. I think he played hockey again after. Yeah. Yeah. You did, yeah. but the, the, the high school kid did not. Yeah. Also, I'm not going back to hockey. I'm not. <laughs> I'm never watching. This is this is two players out of you know four million. But like just the fact that that's like an injury that could happen. Exactly. That's your finger in it. That's. Yeah. 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 Well, the alternative is in guns. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Naomi, there are ten things you can do about that kind of injury. Right. I just, I'm not going to be a fan of it. Yeah. No. Yeah, I get that. I get that. I get that. So, uh, different places on the body have different proportions of organelle with regards to this, you know. Um, in places where you make a lot of glycolipids, glycoproteins, and things like that, these composite kind of things, um, that is one of the hallmark specialties of the animal kingdom, what you can do with good Golgi. Um, what animals do better than anything else is make mucus. It's your one go-to thing that you do as an animal that you do in every situation, regardless of sort of what, what's happening. So there's a lot of pollen in the air right now. What should you do? Make mucus. Uh, you just watched a very moving and touching episode of Great British Baking Show, mm -hmm. and, and you were moved to tears. So what do you make? Mucus. Mucus. Right? You need a lubricant. Mucus works. 
you need an adhesive. I know. Mucus, right? It's like it, it's it's like the WD forty of the of the animal kingdom. It's like it's good for everything. Is it true that um, mucus is also like the uh, like the base of all like diseases? Like um, there things? have been some like theory about that. It's it's a little fringy. It's a little fringy. Mm -hmm. um, but you do use it for protective uh, measures, so to speak, right? You you cover all of your surfaces that are easily invaded with a mucus coat, just because like the virus is going to get in. The first thing he has to do is get through this mm -hmm. mucus layer. Um, and one of the things that, ironic that you should do that, one of the things that you first start to notice when you become a new professor, a faculty member, a teacher, is when you're lecturing up here, amongst the, your charges that you are taking responsibility for, what you hear is a constant. <clears throat> it's nonstop, it's nonstop. <laughs> And it's like you tune it out after a while. But that's what you do, right? Stuff settles in your lungs and you, you just a little involuntary. It's as involuntary as you twitching your right leg to get blood out of your feet and back into your torso. You notice that too. It's like yeah. that little involuntary. You, you, you watch the involuntary things that people do that, you don't, that they don't even know they're doing themselves. And one of those things is like, <clears throat> that's what you do. That's what, has anybody ever stopped smoking before? Stuff, so. Used to, but then you stopped. Yeah. You start coughing up some stuff that are awful. It's that, right? Your your cilia start to <laughs> work again, and you start transporting mucus of all the stuff in your lungs that was stuck in there back up to the surface where you're. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really awful. But yeah, mucus, it's a good thing. Um, you do that in the Golgi. You know, so where in your body do you have a lot of Golgi cells with over overabundance of Golgi? Places like sinuses. Trachea, esophagus, lungs. lungs, lower intestine, nose, right? Places like that. Places inside of the mouth, you know, all good Golgi places. So, um, because, I mean, and believe it or not, we are still having a conversation about macromolecules. You know, it's like, that's all you do in bio one. Let's talk about macromolecules doing this. Let's talk about macromolecules doing that. Talk about macromolecules this other way. It's kind of fun. Sorry. Is it have like stuff like bronchitis or something? And there's like too much mucus. Is that mean like I don't know, like does that have to do with that? It does. It does. Um so there are some illnesses and conditions where you produce an excessive amount of mucus. Your body is like, you know what? I'm just gonna flood the place. <laughs> I'm just gonna flush this whole joint out, you know, and uh, that can help. Is that for like for a certain reason? Like that the body does produce so much. Well, it really is, it really is, you know, opposite flow, right? So I mean it's it provides flow in an opposite direction than the direction things are trying to get in. And I mean, if you want to <laughs> there are these you know fictional, you know, anti-crime devices where instead of carrying a gun, you shoot these things that are inflatable, really sticky things. You know, it's like he's getting away. He's like, chum, chum, chum. and it's like it sticks to them and it blows. It. And it's like, thinking, so what? So now I'm, I'm sticking to everything, you know? Mm -hmm. And it just immobilizes, prevents things from being able to attach, engulfs them in a viscous goo. You know, it's not a bad way to incapacitate something that's trying to get in. Okay. You think about it. Um, I had like one more question. Of um, course. So about, uh, of course. It, it's kind of like on the same. Um, Topic of like, yeah, yeah, topic of what you we're just talking about. Your reason. Yeah, <laughs> so like, town. I know, I know that like we're um, that most things that you know that injure us are we're able to heal. Like you get a, uh, a cut, you know, it becomes a scar and it like goes away. So Usually, like, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I also know that you know, like when it comes to like the ears, the ears don't normally heal. What else? Correct. Heal? Um, typically, things heal in proportion to how well innervated they are with the circulatory system. <laughs> So that's why the ear doesn't heal very well. There's not a lot of circulatory system elements there. Um, ligaments, tendons are notorious for this. If you like a tendon injury or a ligament in, in injury, um, there's not a lot of blood vessels that go there. So it takes a long time to heal. So the more circulatory innervation you get, usually the more rapidly things are able to heal. That makes sense. And, uh, access to blood. It's kind of neat. Oh, there it is.
this. <laughs> well, there you go. Any questions? <laughs> okay, so what do we got to do from here, right? So um, uh, there are a couple of other little things out here, lysosomes, lysosomes that um, are held within the cell that contain uh, like digestive enzymes that are made from the rough ER when you eat stuff. And again, once again, there's more of a bio 102 conversation when you eat stuff, hot dogs, deep fried Oreos, whatever it might be. Um, you eat them, consume them, you swallow them, you know, they go through your, they get broken down in the stomach, blah, blah, blah. They go across the wall of the small intestine and get packaged into a little sphere, a little phospholipid sphere. They fuse into the cell. The contents get dumped inside and fuses with a lysosome, which breaks it all the way down and packages it to get the ATP out of it and all that stuff. Peroxisomes that contain hydrogen peroxide that um, gets used for detox. I mean, when you, when you eat something toxic or consume something toxic, fuse it with a peroxisome that can oxidize stuff. This is what you do with booze. There's a lot of cells that produce peroxisomes in the liver where you detox stuff. So there's a little kind of niche a little floating around things in here that kind of do good stuff. <coughs> uh, but yeah, that's sort of the gist of it for I think what our, our purpose is sort of be. So what we need to start doing, what is today, Wednesday, next Monday, is we need to learn how to divide these things. Stay on, right? Sorry, right? We need to do slow mitosis on this. How do you, how do you have one and get to make two of them out of it? And that's a lot of stuff we need to sort out. That's a lot of stuff we need to sort out. How do you do it? How do you, how do you divide one of these things? My God, look at it. It's complicated. You got a, you got a dual membrane cell membrane in the way. You got to work with that. You got to copy this stuff. You have to figure out how to sort all this nonsense. And you have to like divide the thing in two. All kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff. Are all uh, cell membranes made out of uh, fossil? Yes. Universally. Some have accessory features. Um, plants and bacteria have a cell wall that is usually protein-based or, you know, it's kind of sugar-based on the outside of it. But on the inside of, of all of them, the basis of the cell and its compartmentalization is the phospholipid binder. So early on invention, universal, is one of these universal things, which is kind of cool. And I have one more question for you. Who wants candy? So, <laughs> Peace. That's all I got for today, right? Yeah. Well. Okay. Yeah. So.